Now, of course, I don't just work on ancient technology like tubes and all that kind of jazz. Sometimes I work on things that are a little bit more modern. Specifically, in this instance, this is a Roland Alpha Juno 2 from the mid-1980s, so uh, pretty cutting-edge technology for the time. You know, Six-voice six DCO-based synthesizer that apparently has a couple of issues with the keys not responding correctly, and I'm also going to change out the battery that's inside here because, much like a lot of things from the 80s, it uses a little CR2032 in order to maintain patches when you turn it off and turn it back on. So let's get it on the bench, let's pull it apart, let's check it out, and let's get our 80s on. First up, let's test keybed. Oh, there's one. There's another. All right, so we got two dead keys here. I'm going to mark those off, a little bit of tape, just that way I know exactly what they were, where they were, and all that kind of jazz. There we go. And that one there too. So I found the two dead keys down there. I want to also check the actual touch sensitivity as well, because these were the first ones in the Juno range to actually have touch sensitivity on the keyboard as well. So for example, we go lightly touch, harder, and in this one that looks like it's opening up the filter. And on and on and on. So touch sensitivity works, after touch works, which is good, and we've got two dead keys. So I'm going to pull this apart, I'm going to take a look inside, and I'm going to check these PCBs because sometimes they'll get corrosion on them and that will stop any signals getting through. If it was something real simple, like maybe just the contact strips getting, you know, worn out or something, you'd expect that at least be something when you hit the note, like maybe a loss of touch sensitivity, or if you hit it really hard, then you get something. I don't think that's the case, but we're going to find out by opening it up. Mm, 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 mm. 35 years worth of dust and grime and ugh, all inside this keybed. Not the easiest thing to pull apart either. Every single key needs to come off. All the springs that connect them as well in order to actually access this. Now one thing I can see is straight away we've got some what looks to be dead bugs in there. And that tends to go along with some corrosion too. So let me give this a clean and I'm going to start probing around to see if I can find any shorts or anything that might have gone on because stuff like that there, that corrosion, Happens to be right in line with there's something on that PCB and that's probably going to be stopping signals getting through. Let's give it a closer look. So I've marked out the two keys here that were bad. And so you got two rows of contacts, your upper one and your lower one. Basically what's happening is as you press the key down and you've got your little rubber strip in place, one side of it will make contact before the other. The CPU inside of the keyboard is actually scanning thousands of times a second. And so when it detects that there is a connection on one of those sets of pads, it's going, excellent, that's been registered. And then it measures how long until the second set of pads happen to be made contact with. That time distance in between, obviously the harder you hit it, the faster that is. So the shorter the interval between that. That's how you end up with your touch sensitivity, which is pretty cool. Now this one, we've got that key and we've got that key. And we want to follow basically the traces here on the PCB and if we do we go down here that jumps across there so those are the diodes that help sort of isolate each of the pads on there and it's going down onto this little trace down the bottom which if we wander it down this way we be able to see that we've got a little bit of corrosion there and a chunk of it's actually missing here this here is a fiberglass pen which is really really good because with some fiberglass pen you can use it to clear off corrosion or oxidation on metals or like what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to clear off some of that solder mask there to actually get to the trace that's underneath. Let's give a bit of a closer inspection. I can do that as well and what I can do is actually bridge any bad connections. This is a lot easier than using say for example a razor blade or a scalpel or something like that. It's not going to damage the copper underneath and it's just going to take off kind of what I tell it to 
Just nice and gently without damaging anything. Yep. So right away, we can see that we're actually missing a big old chunk of that trace. There's actually no continuity across that whatsoever. So I'm gonna have to bridge that up with a bit of Kynar wire. Kynar's some good stuff. That's as a result of a bug dying on there. Bugs die, they start like decomposing, and as they do, everything that leaks out of them is quite corrosive to metals. That is probably the source of that, but I don't know why it would be specifically those two keys there, unless I'd ha I'll have to check the actual scanning matrix to see how it's scanning on there, because there might be a second line on here that's a bit kind of funky as well. I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna clean up those corroded patches, do my wire patching, pop the PCBs back in and see if I get um, signal properly. Whilst it doesn't look too good, these are now functional traces. So these ones here, I got rid of the corrosion that was on the traces themselves and then put some solder on top. The reason being is because if you just leave bare copper exposed, it's gonna corrode like mad. That's what the solder mask's there for, to help prevent that. Did the same there as well. And then of course down here, this is where we actually had the corrosion so bad it ate right through the trace. And it looks absolutely tiny, but what we've actually got there is some teeny tiny 30 gauge Kynar wire, silver plated, good stuff, that joins both sides of that trace. Hopefully that should solve what ails us. Let's give it a test, let's find out. Moment of truth time, did that solve our issue? Let's find out, huh? Yes, we now have all of our voices, our keys working. However, um, something kind of bit funky is going on. These notes. Are very loud. There's no touch sensitivity to them. Whereas these ones we do. So I gotta figure out what's going on with that now. Uh, one problem gets dealt with, now you gotta find another one. All right, so let me see what potentially might be happening in that. Of course it was something so simple. <laughs> These do actually have an orientation for a reason. One of the domes is a slightly different size and slightly different distance away from the pad. So now I've actually got Excellent. We've now managed to restore all of those keys, which is excellent. It means I don't have to try and find replacements of these PCBs because they are a nightmare. I once had a Juno 106 in that had completely destroyed key contact PCBs under there. 12 months and I couldn't find one. Just couldn't do anything about it, which sucked, but such is the way things are with these vintage synths. Next step, I've got to replace that CMOS battery because it's the original one that came with it when the unit shipped, and we may as well swap it out whilst we're in here, so that way the customer's got access to all of their patches going forward, and I'm also gonna put a battery holder in there too, so that way you can change out the battery in the next 10 years when that one needs replacing. Now the keybed reinstalled, and that new battery inside of there, this has lost all of its factory patches. There's no information in there anymore, so for me to actually get that back, all I have to do is press and hold the portamento button, data transfer button simultaneously, Flick the switch, there we go, they're now back. So what I can do is I can actually make sure everything's still working, make sure the keybed's doing what it needs to do, then send it on back to the owner, provided there's nothing else going wrong. I am so not a keyboard player, so the extent of my skills are something simple like doing the chromatic runs, just to make sure everything's all working. There we go, keybed is now back. We've got all the factory patches loaded up, I've gone through, given it a test, made sure everything's all working the way it should. So now I'd say it's ready for me to put screws back in, call the customer, let them know it's good to go. So there we have it, another vintage synth all sorted, ready to get on the flame again. These do sound really quite good. They're the kind of synth that 10 years ago were almost jokingly like being thrown out with trash because people didn't want them, but now, People realize they kind of sound good, use an external programmer, they're excellent. 
So, of course, you know, I'll be fixing more things as time goes by and the like, so if you want to keep up to date with those things, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell notification icon. You know, if you're here in Sydney and you want to drop in some stuff for repairs, feel free to pay us a visit, and even if you're not in Sydney, well, you can ship stuff in, because I get stuff in from all across the country. So, until the next time I'm on the bench, I'll see ya. Thank you.